Today on the program, one of my favorite people, humor author Jen Mann, here to talk about writing and the people she wants to punch in the throat coming up. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad you're on the program. You're one of my favorite people, and you're here on a week when I just want to punch things in the throat. So <laughs> what, a, what a great week to have the lady who wrote the books all about yeah. punching people in the throat. So I uh, appreciate you being here. It's been a while. We've got a lot to catch up on. Uh, before we get started, tell the folks uh, who you are and uh, what you do. Right. I'm Jen Mann, and I am a blogger and a New York Times bestselling author. I blog at people I want to punch in the throat.com. I started in 2011, and then I started publishing books in about, I think 2012 was when I started publishing books. And I'm a hybrid author, so I'm published with Random House and self-published. And I've got a bunch of, this will be the third people I want to punch in the throat book. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever run out of material. <laughs> the, the list continues to grow, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's kind of talk about that because you started off as a, as a blogger. Now, talk a little bit about that because I get a lot of authors, you know, number one, they ask me, do I, do I need a website? Do I need a blog? And I think a lot of authors and writers don't understand that, that really having a blog, it's, it's just another outlet for your writing. It's just like a digital book. So talk a little bit about how you got started blogging and how that led into writing books. Yeah. So, well, I was, I'm, I was a realtor and I worked from home and I had my only coworker was my husband. So the two of us were here and we had little kids in those days. I had a four-year-old and a six-year-old and I was just, you know, a frustrated work at home mother that was, I complained a lot about stuff. And so my husband <laughs> asked me to, my husband asked me to start a blog and write it down instead of bitching to him all day. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to suggest that to my wife. <laughs> it's like marriage counseling and, you know, psych counseling all combined. And so he, He's the one who came up with the title because I had no idea. I was like, well, what would I call this blog? What would I? And he's like, people want to punch in the throat. You say it all the time. And so I just started this blog and I would just sort of write whenever the mood struck me and whatever I was upset. I don't want to say upset. It's, it's a humor blog, but mm -hmm. it is, it's a ranty. I get very um, angry about stuff, but in a very, I think, funny way. And, um, and so I did that in the spring. And in that winter, I went viral. I wrote about my elf on the shelf. And I went viral writing about the elf on the shelf. And overnight, I had a million readers that read this blog post. And, and so that sort of launched everything because I wanted to be a writer. I, I told my husband on our very first date that I wanted to be a writer. And so when this happened, it was like, okay, well, here's your chance. And so for me, blogging was that um, sort of like that, that leap Pet. you know it was it gave me that that bounce to do that it it helped me find my voice right you know on the blog I think as an English major I sort of imagined that we were all supposed to write Donna Tartt kind of books you know we were all supposed mm -hmm. to write great American novels and if you had told me that I would write angry sweary ranty <laughs> you know, stuff you know I'm sure my English teachers are all like real you know dying but but I think that it really helped me discover my voice and it definitely helped me discover my audience and so for me I think blogging is a great way to start it's not necessarily you know it's one of those things if you already have an established writing career and you've got books going and you're selling I don't know that you really need to blog but if you're just starting out and you're looking for an outlet and a way to get your your words out there and maybe find some people that think mm -hmm. like you it's a great it's a great thing. And now I sort of determine, is this blog worthy or is it book worthy? And so <laughs> I, want to, you know, I try to publish only original material right. in books. And so I have to decide. So I'll have these great stories that will happen. And then I'll think, no, I got to save that. That's, that's book worthy. <laughs> so, so you're kind of, you're kind of doing that now. How, how do you, how do you discern between the two? What makes say something book worthy as opposed to blog worthy? I think for me, blog worthy is more, I've always written about really topical things, either mm -hmm. like celebrities or politics or, you know, whatever the new fad is or trend. You know, there was a few weeks ago, it was that hairy swimsuit and, you know, and so, so those kinds of things to me are blog worthy, you know, things that kind of don't have a very long shelf life. And, mm -hmm. and if, you know, I wrote about it and I published And so, um, so it's just little things that I can kind of, I can do with, um, I can put it on the blog and I can kind of talk about these things and make fun of them and, and have a funny story, but it's not like an evergreen right. story or an evergreen topic. And so mm -hmm. the evergreen topics go in the books. Do you, do you find the stuff that goes in books is more long form? You have more to say there or is that, yeah. the, is the blog more abbreviated? 
Yeah, the blog, I mean, I've always been very wordy. My blog post, you know, I've read an article, maybe I'd been blogging for two years or so, and I read an article that said a blog post should be 300 words, and I was like, oh, crap. Like, I think, I, I'm, I'm like, I need 800 words just to make the joke. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I've always been like a really wordy person, but the, the essays in the books are always much longer. I give a lot more detail and backstory and, and that sort of thing, and so that's the other, yeah, that's the other part of it. That makes yeah, it. I, I think somebody made up that 300-word thing, just they pulled it out of their ear. I like to punch them in the throat. <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the things I, I love about you. I think the last time we talked, it's been a couple of years now, but you, I think I called you Irma Bombeck with attitude or a pissed <laughs> off Irma Bombeck. I don't remember. Did, did you ever read her stuff? Were you a fan of, of Irma Bombeck? You know, I'd always heard of her, of course. I mean, she's always been part of you know, everybody mm -hmm. talks about Irma Bombeck. Um, and I didn't start reading her, though, until I started writing. One of the very first comments I got when I went viral was from a friend who, a woman who's now a real good friend of mine, but at the time, you know, I didn't know her. She was a stranger. And she said, you are Irma Bombeck with F-bombs. And so that sort of <laughs> became like my elevator speech. You know, when people will say like, well, what do you write? I'm like, yeah. Irma Bombeck with F-bombs. You yeah. know, that sort of sums it all up. Um and now I've read her more, but I try not to, you know, it's really hard. I try not to read in my own genre because I don't want yeah. to steal anybody. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know who she is and I've read her, but I, I don't read a whole lot of her. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, I, I write a lot of humor too. Um, you know, mine's not as angry as yours, but uh, borderline sometimes. But yeah, I'm with you. I, uh, I used to read, I can't remember his name, but he was a Louis Grizzard. He was a famous Southern humorist that I actually met once. And I, I would always find myself reading Louis's books going, I can write like that. Mm -hmm. Which is not really what you want to do as a writer. You want you, you don't want to strictly copy someone's style. And I, I think you're I don't think you're uh, you're not infringing Irma in any way whatsoever. I just uh, I've always been a fan of hers and I loved her writing. But she you probably say the things that she would have loved to have said uh, if she was alive and writing today. Well, and yeah. I like to think that she was spicy for her times. Yeah, you know? yeah. and yeah, so maybe she would like me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that that really made her irreverent, and it's kind of sexist. You know, oh, she was a really funny woman. Yeah. Hell, she was a funny human being. But I think the one thing that made her unique, and you too, you, God love you. You look like the the average soccer mom. You got you know you got to get out. You got to take the kids and uh, out to soccer and do the school stuff, and then you lock yourself in a room and write f bombs for a living. Yeah. So, well, and, you know, and going back to your sexist thing, I get that a lot where it's like, well, you're a mom. I can't believe you write that stuff. I can't believe you say that. And I'm thinking, does anyone call Stephen King and say, I can't believe you wrote that you're a dad? Like, yeah. it just, that frustrates me that I'm a mom, but I'm yeah. a mom who, just because I'm a mom doesn't mean I can't swear and I can't have opinions about stuff. <laughs> Let me tell you what, my, my <laughs> wife swears more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, uh, uh, Roseanne Barr. Uh, did an interview yeah. once and she's like, you know, if someone else calls me a funny woman, I'm going to kick their ass. And, and it's the same kind of thing, but, uh, but you know, th that's also your appeal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the first time you and I talked, I'm like, well, this is a nice young lady. And you know, Hey, how the fuck are you? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. um, so you, you transitioned from blog writing to books. And, and I think you said you've got a background in English, but you had never really been a writer prior to that. Um, I held a few writing jobs, like through college and stuff like that, but I'd really kind of, uh, when I came out of college, I, I would have loved to have had, you know, if the internet existed and all that kind of thing, you know, I would have loved to have been able to self-publish or yeah. blog or any of that. But that just wasn't available to me in the, in the nineties. Um, and so I had to take, you know, a real job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to go down that route and, and some of them involved writing, but it was a lot of technical writing and speech mm -hmm. writing and which was great, you know, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. And it wasn't yeah. until, you know, I hit whatever I was, I think for, you know, late thirties. And then I realized, Oh, Hey, I can do this. And so, but, you, but you've always, always been funny though, right? I've always been funny. I've always been mouthy. Um, but I haven't been, you know, I think that's the other thing about blogging, going back to your question about blogging, blogging gave me confidence too. Mm -hmm. You know, I had not been a very strong, confident writer before that. Like I really, you know, I knew I was funny, but I didn't know anybody else thought I was funny. <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> like my mom thinks I'm hilarious. Right. So I think, you know, the blogging actually gave me that confidence, too, to have so many strangers come out of the internet and tell me that I was funny. I was like, really? You guys like that? Because I have a shit ton more of that. <laughs> so, so I think that helped, too. Well, yeah, it, I think it's a great way to, to practice the craft and kind of get into it. Now, let's talk about uh, when you first decided to, to write a book. What was that first book? 
The very first book was called Spending the Holidays with People I Want to Punch in the Throat. <laughs> <laughs> and that well, was, I assume that was uh, based on something that really happened, huh? Well, yeah. So what it was, was, you know, after I went viral with The Elf on the Shelf, um, people were asking, my readers were asking for a book. And I thought, I don't know how to write a book. I don't know what, what would I write? And right. And a friend of mine, she's a marketing person, and she came up with the idea. She said, well, you know, there's all these books of um, essays out there, all these humor books with just stories. You don't mm-hmm. need to write, like, a whole novel. And she said, why don't you write a book about holidays? You know, put the elf on the shelf in there, since that's your number one post, and mm-hmm. then write other holiday stories. And then I actually sat down, and I read Jen Lancaster's book, Bitter is the New Black. And that one was sort of – that sort of was the blueprint. I was like, oh look at this you can just write funny silly stories and people Mm -hmm. love it and so so that was sort of how I started doing so I made a list of stories I could tell and that I wanted to tell and I knew I had to self-publish that book because I felt like you know on the internet you only you have such a short lifespan of when your your iron is hot and so I felt like I couldn't waste time querying and trying to find an agent and then try to find a publisher. And so while I wrote, my husband figured out how to self-publish. And so we put that book out oh, way too fast. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> you bought that book. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not edited. Like, it was, and so we put that out in um, October of 2012. And and it did really, really well. It went really well on Amazon and iTunes and every place. And then that sort of caught the attention of New York. Mm-hmm. And, and I was able to use that to, and that's, you know, again, with blogging, like I was able to use that plus the platform I had with blogging because with nonfiction, they really want a good platform. They want a big platform from you. And so right. I've been able to build that platform while I was writing the book. And I don't remember how many thousands of fans I had at that point, maybe 25,000 or something like that. But I had they were really engaged and loyal and they bought books and they left reviews and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so that really attracted the attention of New York and that's how I got my book deal. Cool. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to turn on something up here. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm always making little adjustments. It's it's the anal Annie part of me. (laughs) Okay. Um, You you mentioned the elf on the shelf a couple of times. What, tell us exactly what that was. It was a, it was a blog post. It was a rant. Right. For or against? What was it, it? I don't know what you'd call it. Okay, so so the elf on the shelf is this little doll that you have to move around your house, and you, he's magic, and your kids believe that he reports to Santa. And I still remember it was the first week of December, and I had forgotten to move him because I always forget to move him. And, I <laughs> to move him. and my husband and I sort of had an argument about it. It was like 1130 at night, and I was like, you go do it. You know, I do it all the time. You go move him. And he's a truther. He wants um, – he hates that Santa gets all the credit for the good stuff. Just like, no, <laughs> I was that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So he's like, no, it's time to tell them the truth, you know, and I'm like, they're four and six, asshole, you can't do that yet, and so, (laughs) so I was like, forget it, I'm going to go move it, so I went and I moved it, and I updated my Facebook page, well, at that point, I didn't really have a Facebook page, I had just my personal profile, but I, I had learned enough about blogging that, as a blogger, if you do something and you don't put it on social media, then it never happened. So mm-hmm. I had to put it on social media that I got up and I moved my doll. And I just said something about, you know, has anybody, it's the first week and I'm already forgetting, is anybody else forgetting? And it's 1130 at night on a, you know, on a Tuesday night or something. And all these parents, all these moms, oh my God, me too. Ah, oh, crap. I forgot that thing. Ah, <laughs> shoot, I got to go do it. You know, thanks for the reminder. Right. And this woman who had no children, she, um, she's a dog mom. She came out and said, I don't see what the big deal is, moms. You just need a system. And then she dropped this link to a blog post about 101 ideas of things to do with your elf on the shelf. And it was things like trash your kitchen and say the elf did it. Tee hee hee. Um, have a pillow fight. Feathers everywhere. And it was like so much work. Like I'm already like trying to work, trying to take care of my kids, trying mm-hmm. to keep my house clean. My, hit, my house is already a pit. No one's going <laughs> to believe that the elf on the shelf did it. And, and, And I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't need to do all this to prove that I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. Like, my kids are fine, damn it. (laughs) So (laughs) so I – and I have a a good friend who is a high – this is too much. I was like, yeah, you're right. And so I sat down and I just spit out this blog post where I kind of broke down her list and was like, no, you – I don't need to be so magical. Every day is – magic you know and I just don't need this this is right. I'm a good mom and I'm tired of being feeling like I'm not you know and it was mm-hmm. sort of that yeah. same, it was a time period when um 
Pinterest had just come into existence. And so we were all feeling that pressure to be perfect and to make the best crafts and food and workouts and outfits. And, and so I think it just really struck a nerve. I was one of the earlier people who complained about motherhood, you know, <laughs> up until that point, bloggers were very much uh, rainbows and sunshine that mm-hmm. you know, everything was perfect. And look at this amazing stuff I do with my children. And, and so I was kind of the first person to pull that veil back and say, no, mm-mm. like I am a good mom. Don't tell me I'm not. Yeah. And, and so I published it that night and about a week later, it just sort of organically, it had picked up like, you know, I didn't, I've gone back to try to figure out, man, cause I'd like to do it every week if I could. <laughs> so I went back to sort of figure out kind of what happened, but it didn't get picked up by, you know, nowadays it's like, you see these viral hits that get picked up by the Today Show mm-hmm. or something like that. It, I didn't have any of that. It was literally just people sharing it with other people and it was amazing. And so that first day with the million plus reads and I got 17,000 people to follow me and now I have over a million on social media. That's amazing. It's amazing. And don't you want to find that woman who came up with 101 ideas of what to do and punch her in the throat? Well, okay. So that's a funny story. So I lamented what to do about it because she, you know, at that time she was a much bigger blogger than me. And I felt like, what should I do? And I read, you know, a lot of bloggers have um, this section on their blog where they'll say, if you're going to talk about me, please link back to me to the article that you referenced. So I thought, okay. So I've linked back to her thinking, you know, she'll get 10 hits from me. Well, I crashed (laughs) her site. And so, so she emailed me and she was like, Hey, you know, you crashed my site and you said mean things. And I was like, Oh, sorry, but I still mean it. And, And so we had a conversation and she kind of explained her side and it, you know, it ended up being that, She's that way because that's the way she wants to be, that it's not, you know, and that she wasn't trying to judge people. She was just, that's just how she does yeah. things. So, yeah. so is it, you know, we had a good conversation. And then when the book came out, she ordered signed copies from me. To that's her. pretty, that's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Did you see that? What was the movie with uh, Mila Kunis? Was it Angry Moms or something like that? Bad Moms. Bad yes. Moms. Did you see that movie? I haven't seen it yet. No, you got, you have to, I mean, the plot of that movie is, is literally what you just said. This, this mom, uh, you know, her husband is is suddenly out of the picture. She's driving herself crazy. She's trying to work and she finally just goes, screw this. I'm a bad mom. I'm going to have fun. The kids are going to be okay. I'm not going to go, you know, make believe that the, the elf did things, you know, or maybe in your case, the, you should have cleaned the house and blamed it on the elf. Yeah, that, then they would have believed. They'd still believe now. <laughs> they, would, they would be calling Jesus, Jen. Yes, wow, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> so, so just from that first blog post, which was, was really timely, really topical, you know, the Elf on the Shelf is a big thing at Christmas. Um, you, you started writing a book, and that was how long ago? Um, that was 20, December of 2011. Okay, so six years ago, mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, now, how many books have you written? Well, I've written, um, this will be my third People I Want to Punch in the Throat book. So this will mm-hmm. be my third collection of nonfiction humor. I wrote a, uh, this year I wrote a YA um, humor fiction book this huh? year, My Lame Life. And then I've published, I've published five anthologies um, with other people. So when I first went viral and I first wrote my first book and it did so well, I had tons of people come out of the woodwork and ask me how they could do that too. And I didn't really have an answer. And, and so what I did say though, as I said, you know what, I know what's funny. I know what my audience likes. I know how to sell books to them. How about we, I publish a book. You guys all write me one funny essay and I will publish this book and I will, we'll sell it together. And so that book was called, I just want to pee alone. Which I love by the way. Thank you. I love that book. (laughs) And so we published that book and that is like the little book that could, I mean, that book has sold thousands and thousands and thousands of copies. Like that one hit the New York times. Um, and I've, since then I've put out four more in that anthology. So this year, uh, was, but did you die? And this one was the first time I had uh, men join me. In the past, it's all been ladies. And this time, I brought in some dads, too. And this one is terrible parenting advice. <laughs> and so um, so I've got five of those. And then I've got a bunch of um, – I have a bunch of Kindle shorts, like ebook shorts that mm-hmm. I do. Mm-hmm. So when you were saying earlier, like, what's blog-worthy and what's book-worthy, these are stories that are – they're, they're too long and too involved to go on the blog, but there's not enough of them to tell a whole story around it. Mm-hmm. And so right. they're kind of like 
little hodgepodges, and I have six of those, six volumes of those, and Would, they're ebook only. Do Do you enjoy doing any certain kind of book more than the others? Because I mean, you really are you're you're kind of all over the place within your genre, but you've gone from you know I want to pee alone to punch in the throat, and now you've done the YA fiction. Uh, t- tell me about that. Was that uh, was that something unusual for you to try to do? Had you written fiction before? Um, I've actually, I've never finished a fiction novel before. <laughs> but I'm started. Yeah. Um, that one was because of my kids. Cause now my kids are 12 and 10 and about a year ago. And then, and I don't let them because you know, it's so funny. Like I am a cusser, but I don't really cuss a lot in front of my kids. And so, um, and I, I so I don't let them read my, my work. They don't read my blog. They don't read my books. And so about a year ago, they asked me, you know, when are you going to write a book that we can read that we can do too? And I was like, Oh, you guys, is that what you want? And so, so I started writing my lame life. And, um, at first it was really hard. Like I really didn't, I was really struggling because it's, you know, I used to think it would be better to write fiction because then I could really punch people in the throat and not, you know, not just dream about it. And, but it was really hard because it's just a different, it's just a different way to get your brain thinking. Um, you know, with nonfiction, I already know the beginning, middle and end of the story because it's happened. And with fiction, it's like, I have to sort of create that as we go along and figure out where, where it's going to go. Um, but once I got on a roll with it, I really liked it. And um, I'm working on the second book now. It's a series. And so I'm working on the second one now. And I think fiction, you know, I say that I've got, for sure I have one more people I want to punch and throw a book left. I mean, possibly two. At, you know, as my kids get older, there's more stories. But I think fiction is really where I want to pivot to and do um, YA and women's fiction. I'd love to write like a Bridget Jones diary kind of thing and, you know, do something like that. So you wrote this book so your kids, who you lovingly refer to as Gomer and Adolfa, could read your your work. Uh, how did you come up with those names? I know they're not their real names. I just, you, you've got you're married to Hubs, and mm-hmm. you have Gomer and Adolfa as your kids. Yeah, that all came <laughs> from going viral too. Um, but when I started my blog, you know. 25, 30 people read it, and most of them were related to me, and so I didn't think anything of using my kids' real names and all that, mm-hmm. and when I went viral, um, you know, it was popular with, with most people, like 98% of people really liked what I had to say, but there was that 2% that hated my guts, yeah, and, um, and came after me, and you know, said things like, you're a terrible mother, and you should not have children, and I'm going to take your kids away from you, and it really scared me and freaked me out, and so at that point, we just made the decision that if I was going to keep doing this, my husband and my kids were off limits. They were completely, they had to go, and then I really, I was anonymous at first, too. Like, there were no photos of me either, yeah. and my name was not out there, and um, and so- and you, you still don't put your, your picture on your books, do you? Um, that one might, I can't remember if I put one in there or not. I, I love that. By the way, I love the inscription to the angry asshole. Hey, that, would be, that would be me. <laughs> so, um, so, so you felt the need to keep it private to keep the kids shielded. I did. And so what I did is I don't even know where my book is, but I have this book that sits here on my desk. Usually I don't see it right now, but I have a book of a thousand, 10,001 baby names. And I use it when, cause I use fake names for everybody. And I try to use really awful, bizarro mm-hmm. names. And and uh, I just sort of opened and flipped through this book, and I came up with Gomer, and, <laughs> and I thought, okay, that'll work, and then Adolfa, because I tried to pick names that of people I didn't know, because here I'm worried about my children's safety, that someone's going to be like, hey, you know, Michael, come here, and then someone else is like, well, then why did you give them my kid's name? Like, if you're yeah. so afraid, like, why are you giving them my kids? So I tried to give them names that I thought no one would ever give their children, and there would never be any question. Well, I live in Alabama, and I know a Gomer. Do you really? Oh, yes, gosh. he will be. He's a produce manager at the grocery store. <laughs> so he would probably be honored that you were using his name. Let's talk a little bit about the haters, because I, I hear this. I, I coach a lot of new authors, and they're always talking about, you know, one of the, the great fears they have is that people are going to hate their work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, haters are going to hate, to quote Taylor Swift or – Plato or whoever, how do you, how do you handle that? I mean, you, cause you, now that you are on the level that you are, uh, I'm sure there are haters out there. Do you, do you just ignore them? Do you understand that some people are just buttholes or what do you do? <laughs> um, a little bit of everything. Um, sometimes, you know, the first few times it was, it was frightening and it was, and it was sad. You know, I do felt you like- engage with them. 
I do sometimes. I do. I, I do knew like you to, would. I do like to poke the bear. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sometimes I let you. I wield the band stick um, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. The way I see it is, this is my house. You can come on my social media pages, and I love to have you there, and I love the internet, the interaction. And I love to talk to you. But if you're going to come in my house and shit on my rug, then yeah. you're going to get banned. <laughs> and so, so I wield that band stick liberally, <laughs> so and right. take out people all the time. Um, I report to uh, Facebook. It doesn't do a whole lot, but I feel like I at least wanted to go on the record that this person is harassing me, that this person has you know threatened me or what have you. Um, and I do engage sometimes though. I do think it's interesting because sometimes part of being on the internet, you know, when I first started this, I was very, I was very much in a bubble, you know, and I didn't know a lot about stuff. And now mm -hmm. I feel like if you send me a well-crafted email stating your facts and your opinions and your points, a lot of times I will, I will, I will hear your side, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't always agree with you, but I have become softer over the years. I will say that, that I, I tend to see things more from other people's point of views now. And I appreciate that if it's brought to me with common decency, sure. <laughs> you know, there are certain things there are lines in the sand that I'm not going to cross and you're never going to convince me, but, but some things I can understand now and I, and I will listen to you. But, um, but if you're just a dick, then yeah, I'm going to poke your and, and isn't the world full of dicks? God. So many. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the business of writing because you have, uh, you've self-published, you've been traditionally published. You are a, a hybrid, if you will. Um, do you have a preference uh, as to how that goes? Is one easier than the other? Is it? Uh, I think they both have their pros and cons. And mm -hmm. I think it really depends upon um, what you're publishing. Um, for me, you know, the anthologies, the, um, PL, the Just One P Alone anthologies, they have always been self-published. I've never tried to take those traditional. Right. I think it's already like herding cats when I have 35 other people part of a book. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine trying to do it with New York involved in that. And so those are something that I've always kept in my house and kept them to me. Um, I think that self-publishing is a great way if – you know, I see a lot of new writers who are struggling and who get rejected three and four times, you know, for years and years, right. and not three and four times, three and four years, I should say. And, um, you know, I've just, I've met so many successful self-published people now that have that same story that I feel like, why wouldn't you at least try it? You know, yeah. why, what have you got to lose? It's a, you know, it might cost you $3,000, but my gosh, you know, try it to invest it. If you believe in yourself, invest in yourself. And yeah. so, um, you know, New York was a, is a good experience too, though, because, you know, there's nothing quite as satisfying as walking into uh, Barnes and Noble or something and seeing yep. your book on the shelf next to Mindy Kaling, you know, and thinking like, that's me. I did that. That's yeah. me. And they are, you know, they take everything off of me. I, I turn in a manuscript and then I don't see it again until it is ready to go. Whereas with self-publishing, I'm the one finding the editor. I'm the one finding a copy editor. I'm the one finding a cover designer, you know, that sort of thing. But I am kind of a control freak. So for me to hint, so for, with New York, the pace kind of um, frustrated me with how slow everything yeah. moves. Um, and so it just depends. But there are certain books that I think are, I tried to take, um, I took Lame Life to my agent and he, that's my, um, that was my, my YA book. And he really didn't care for it. He was like, mm, there's nothing special here. Nothing really that great. And I, and I was kind of disappointed and I picked up my daughter from school that day and she'd already read it. And I picked her up from school and she said, Hey, did you ever hear back from your agent about lame life? And I said, actually I did today. And he said, it's kind of meh. He doesn't really care for it. And she's like, well, pfft. Good thing you know how to self-publish, Mom. We don't need it. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, you know, because I kind of thought, well, I'm gonna shelve it, and, uh, and yeah. she was like, she's like, my friends will buy it. Well, you know, we like it, and and so I think that's, you know, I really would for YA. I think YA has been tougher as a self-pub. It's mm -hmm. the audience. It, it's you know, my audience, my audience that's buying it. They're buying it for their kids, right. and you know, but to try to break into like that, the whole teenage market, it's. It's a tough. Yeah, you know, unless you're writing vampires or fairies or stuff like that, YA. I, I actually wrote a YA book for I, I ghost wrote it for a a client, and it was the same kind of thing. It was it was a mystery and it did very well. But you know, he said, you know, I unless there's 
vampires and spies I wouldn't touch why yeah. because especially from a from a humor standpoint but you know the nice thing is now it is very easy to self publish anybody can go to Amazon and create space and do all that and as you know it's it's not so much the writing these days it's the marketing that sells the books yeah. you know talk talk about the business side of this because you know no longer does Jan men just get to write really funny books you got to get out there and market and sell those damn things right well and even when you're traditionally published I mm-hmm. mean with Random House it was the same thing I mean I had my meeting with my team and we talked about the marketing and ideas and number one was you need to tell your million fans that you have a new book yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And I was like, got it and they're like you need a blog I'm like got it but what else are we gonna do you know? yeah It's like a lot of it still falls on you, no matter Mm -hmm. whether you're traditional or self, you know, the money for the traditional publisher for their marketing goes to the big guys who keep the lights on. And so so I think that, um, you know, when people ask me like what my day is like, I mean, I spend, I spend two, three hours writing, but I spend the rest of the time promoting. Yeah. Do you, are you on online a lot? I did a a video recently about the, the, the top 10 ways to market your your book online and of course you know websites and blogs but social media is such a huge thing now because that's where the readers and fans are tell me about your social media endeavors yeah so my social media endeavors are kind of different from everybody else's i think because i have i have three big pages that um i people want to punch in the throat i just want to pee alone and you know what happens at your house too the title just makes me snicker every (laughs) freaking time (laughs) and those Three big pages have hundreds of thousands of fans on them, um, but they kind of became like a business. Like it became yeah. like you were publishing something every hour, and you know, and you can only what is it the eighty twenty rule? You know, you can only promote yourself twenty percent of the time, and eighty percent of the time you got to do other things. Yeah. And and so I started. So it was about two years ago, three years ago, when Random House was publishing my first book, um, People I Want Punch in the Throat, and. That was the first time I was really coming out. My my name was going to be on it. My picture was going to be on it. And I thought, well, shoot, I might as well just come out completely. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I opened up my personal Facebook page, my Gen Man Facebook page. And I just sat there and it's wide open to the public. And I just waited because I felt like I want people to find me. I want my super fans to find me and be my friend and, and try to friend me. And and Facebook will let you have 5,000 personal friends, but they'll ha- let you have unlimited followers. Right. And so... So I maxed out on friends and I've got, I don't know, 4,000 followers or something on there, but that is where I spend the bulk of my time and the bulk of my energy because those are my, those are my super fans. Those are my people who, who know me really well. They want to support me. The big pages, I was feeling like it just kept devolving into fights and arguments and I was just policing all the time and I don't want to do that. And so my, my personal page, you just know, don't be a dick. Like if you're going to be my friend, we can disagree, but don't be a dick. Right. most like 99.9% of people are so cool uh, over there. And so I haven't had to do anything with that. And then I also have a private Facebook group. I have um, Jen man's BFFs and I have, um, and I'm really active in there too. And that's where I do giveaways for my books and I do a book club every month and I bring in other authors to talk to us about their books. And, and so I just try to do stuff where I'm just being me because I feel like my brand is me. I write so many, you said before, I write so many different things. But if you like me, you're probably going to like the most of what I write. And so, so I'm just constantly trying to just be myself and connect with people on a personal level. I think that's one of the really cool things about social media, though, is the, the interaction you can get with your fans and your readers, and you can build that relationship. It's just, you know, to, to me, if, if I can go on Facebook or Twitter and make a direct connection with a Gen Man or, uh, you know, a, a David Baldacci or, or anyone like that, it's just, you couldn't do that in the old days. So mm-hmm. nowadays the writers are having to do a lot of the marketing themselves. Fortunately, social media is, is really helpful in, in doing that. So, and I'm sure you found that the, the interactivity and the relationships you're building with the readers uh, really impact the sales of the books, I would think. I think so. I mean, there's days like it's funny because with self-publishing, you can track your sales every day. You know, every morning I wake up and I look at my sales numbers and I can see that like, you know, oh, yesterday I didn't, I didn't talk enough. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yesterday I was too quiet. I need to talk more because it is, it's, it's a direct correlation. And, and then, you know, the other thing too, is they're invested in you because they are my friends now. Like, I feel like there's so many of them. I know, I know because we are friends on Facebook. I see their kids first day of school pictures and I see Mm -hmm. their, you know, all the things they're, they're doing. And so I feel like I know them and, 
um, when I was when I announced that I was publishing this book, this working with people on punching the throat, people asked me if I was going on tour. And and I said, well, you know, this one I'm self-published, and so I don't really have, like, a tour budget or whatever. And I said, but, you know, I tell you what, if you plan it and get me 25 people to come and buy a book in advance, I will come to your city. I have 20 cities signed up. Like, wow. Uh, yeah. So, like, that's the kind of engagement that 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 readers can give you when you are interacting with them on a personal level. Yeah. Do you do digital book tours kind of like this where you're just kind of talking to a group? You know, I haven't, and I need to look into that. Um, you know, this week I made a guess. Video. Guess who's an expert on that kind of thing? <laughs> can you help me with that? I can help you with that, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. My, yeah. internet, my internet okay. connection is unstable, it says. Yeah, that's okay. It's still okay. recording. Okay. No, seriously, I, that, that's something I'd be more than happy to help you with. But, and and I've, got, I've had some of my coaching clients do that where, you know, they would want them to come to like, you know, New Yorker, and they're like, you know, look, it's going to cost me a thousand bucks for the plane ticket, da, 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 set up a big screen TV, and I'll do it virtually, which literally works just like what we're doing here. So uh, something to, to think about. Um, as always, when I talk to you, the time goes too fast. I want to talk about the new book, People I Want to Punch in the Throat. Now, this one is Cantankerous Clients, Micromanaging Minions, and Other Supercilious Scourges. Scourges? Scourges. Scourges. Now, this is the third one. What were the first two about? Uh, the first one was uh, people I want to punch in the throat, and that was uh, competitive crafters, drop-off death spots, and other suburban scourges. And that one, <laughs> um, I live in a, I live in a, you know, in a, in a suburban hellhole, I guess. No, no. <laughs> Like it's like minivans and Costco's, you know, as far as you can go. Yeah. And um, you know, yoga pants and all that good stuff. And so I just that's just me and the the being the PTO president and the things I dealt with and like, you know, my kids stuff and soccer and mm -hmm. just all that good stuff. Like if you live in suburbia and you're there because you love Target and, you know, a lawn, but you hate everything else about it, right. you know, then that's <laughs> the book for you. And then um spending the holidays with people on punching the road, which was uh, ho ho humble braggers, Yahoo, Yuletide Yahoos, and other seasonal scourges. <laughs> and that <laughs> one is um, so that one was actually the first book that I published, but Random House bought that book and then we mm. fixed it and we made it so much better. <laughs> and so it has a whole bunch of um, stories about different holidays and um, my very first Mother's Day where my husband gave me a scale for real. He gave me a scale. You still the married to this guy? Can you believe it? <laughs> and, but you know what? That was a really shitty gift, but you got a great story to throw in his face until he dies. Exactly. And that's all I care. And in fact, he is the one who will come to me and say, hey, remember when I gave you a scale? You should write about that. That was great. You know. So I think he almost does it now just to give me fodder. Yeah. I, I gave my wife a vacuum cleaner once and I still hear about it. <laughs> Yeah, and then the new one is working with people I want to punch and throw, and these are all the jobs that I've had, all the crappy jobs I've had throughout my life that got me here, um, and I say that, you know, I've told some serious stories in there, and mm -hmm. I cannot, I will probably never get hired again, so I need everyone <laughs> you to think? this book, because <laughs> I think every HR manager is going to be like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> you know, any anytime you you send me a book or I actually cough up the money to buy one, uh, I always go to the table of contents and read your chapter titles. Uh, let's see. There's the early years: how I became the richest loser in junior high and the envy of all the neighborhood soccer moms. And then you go down nepotism and pocket protectors. My first real job. Uh, that awkward moment when your college advisor tells you to lose your dreams and major in your misses. This is funny stuff. Talk a little bit about the, the book and the time we've got left. It, it's really uh, workplace related. It talks about some of your jobs and some of the wonderful people that you've uh, come into contact with. Yeah. Well, the, you know, I started working, I, th I think I talked about my very first job that was the, uh, the Envy of the Soccer Moms when I was about 12 or 13. I was started babysitting mm -hmm. and um, I made I made enough cash that I had a, a down payment on a house. <laughs> <laughs> I was a pretty good babysitter, I guess. And so, so I, I, uh, I did babysitting. I had, yeah. And then I had a college professor who told me that, uh, nobody would ever buy a want ad that I would write. And so, so this book is dedicated to him. <laughs> you know? Hey, asshole. Hey, Here you go. Thanks, Dick. And, um, Oh, and, funny. And then I've got, uh, yeah. So he told me I should just focus on getting my MRS instead and just, you know, just marry, just marry well. That's all you got to yeah. do, Jen. 
This and is just, this is I, I can just read the table of contents and quit. This, this is, is not even like 1965. Like this is 1990. And he's like, you should marry well. And I'm like, are you insane? So, um, yeah. And then I have like, uh, the, I went to an interview with a, with a plastic surgeon who spent the whole time instead of telling me about the job, telling me all the things on my body he could fix for me. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> you, you're somehow you either come into contact with some really interesting people or you come away from normal people with really interesting outlooks right you know that's funny because that's an uh that was a question you asked me the very first time and nobody had ever asked me that and i always talk about it now because you asked me do funny things happen to me or do i just make it funny yeah. and and i think it's a little bit of both i think that if we are aware of what's going on in our day we always have funny interactions with people we just don't yeah. realize it's funny and if you're willing to embarrass yourself it can yeah. be funny like, you know, this guy, this, this doctor told me basically that I'm hideous and that I mean, <laughs> the only thing that I have going for me is I don't at least have a hump on my back, but everything else like needed to be fixed. And, and I actually read that story. I was, uh, I was at a, I was at a writer's conference in Idaho a few months ago and they had me do like a live reading and I decided I'd read a chapter from this new book. And so I read that chapter and the room, like they didn't know if they should laugh or not. I mean, they were like, Oh God. I'm like, no, you guys, it's funny. Like, it's okay. Like I'm yeah. I'm over it. Like, I know my nose doesn't look exactly like a sausage, just a little bit like a sausage. Yeah. Like, it's okay. Well, maybe, maybe he was just outlining the perks of working for him. Oh, that's exactly, yeah. I mean, he was like, I can do all the surgeries that you need for free. And he's like, and you're going to need some. <laughs> you know? so, Son of a bitch. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, the, uh, it goes back to the question I asked you on the other interview is, you know, I think you have to be a naturally funny person to write the books that you write, but you also have to have a, kind of a skewed outlook on life because yeah. especially nowadays, Jen, I mean, the world's so angry. Everybody's yeah. always mad or pissed off. And, you know, I mean, it's, they say that you can find humor in almost anything. And I think that you've, uh, you've pretty much become a, a master at that or a mistress, which is it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Mistress, I guess. Yeah. So what do you got coming up? Um, I'm just working on uh, My Lame Life 2, and um, that one's due to the editor in October, and and then, I don't know, I mean, I've got this book tour, I'm kind of just trying to get this lame life one done before I leave on book tour in September, and uh, get that ready and put away, and then probably in September and October, I'll be gone on tour across the country, and I plan to just sort of do social media during that time, and I'm trying not to even set any goals for myself. There you, there you go. <laughs> Having goals is so overrated. Hey, if folks want to find out more about Gen Man and all your wonderful books, where should they go? Oh, they should go to peopleiwantapunchinthroat.com or they can find me on Facebook. You know what? If you go to Google and you type in your name, you get your website and then you get this website of this lady who is a painter. It's a Canadian and if you go, artist. All, all, you know, she's all pink and soft and pretty pictures and then you've got you. Yeah. I like you much better. I know. <laughs> I get, you know, I have a Google alert on my name and I get a lot and, and she's, she's killing it. She's doing great stuff. <laughs> well, people are wondering why this, this nice painter lady wants to punch people in the throat. Maybe Probably. you guys should collaborate and I know. Take I feel advantage. bad for her. I can't imagine what kind of mail she's getting. So. That's hilarious. Hey Jen, it's always a pleasure. Will you come back and do it again? Of course. All Thank right, you good. so much, Tim. Thank you. Go, go punch someone. Oh, I'm, well, you know, I'll think about it. All right. Talk to you soon. <laughs> See you later. Bye. 